Today I want to discuss how we extract lithium from brine in terms of the various approaches we make in preparing the processed brine to a form where we can extract lithium carbonate. I'm going to contrast two regions, a mountainous region where we have a perennial lake and a mountainous region where we have a salt flat or a salar. And these are the reasons I've chosen to illustrate this. We're going to focus in on salar to Atacama in the Andes. And we're going to look at the Chinese brine systems in Zabuye and Kaidam, focusing mainly in to Zabuye, which is a perennial lake system, while Atacama is a salar or salt flat derived lithium system. If we look at the lithium content in these two regions, we can see that Salar de Atacama has the highest lithium content up to 1500 ppm in the natural brine systems beneath the salt flat surface of the Salar. And we contrast that with the perennial lake waters in the high altitude lake in Tibet, that is Sabuya Kaka, which is the only known region in the world where we actually get lithium carbonate as a direct precipitate from a brine. There we have lithium carbonate salts which are unique and accordingly the lithium carbonate salt has been named after that lake. It's known as Zabulite. If we look at the levels of lithium in the various salars in the Americas, we can see that Salar de Atacama has very high levels of natural lithium in the brines compared to other salars in the high altitude regions of the Andes and also in the various salt lakes of the United States. So Salar de Atacama, for some reason, has a very high lithium content compared to the other salars in the region. Before we do that, let's look at the hydrology of enrichment. And I want to compare and contrast three hydrological styles that we see in natural lithium brine systems. At one end of the spectrum, we have the brine lakes, the perennial brine lakes, or the concentrated pans, which tend to be density and thermally stratified bodies of water, with less dense water floating atop more saline, denser brines. That is the situation in Lake Zabuye. At the other end of the spectrum, we have the Salar or the Salt Flat or the Sabka system, where we have a water table in the subsurface, usually centimetres to a metre or more below the surface, and we have a capillary fringe where capillary evaporation is taking place and halite is precipitating in that capillary fringe sediment, and the surface of that system is subaerial. And then we have the intermediates between these two end members where we have ephemeral brine sheets which dry up and transition into a salar or sabka system. And this is quite typical of many of the salar margins in the Andean salars. So let's focus in on Salar de Atacama, which is a natural concentrator stump for lithium brines. There we see two brine sources feeding into the evaporating capillary brines in that system. We have an extensive region of stratovolcanoes, which are quite lithium enriched, and they have associated geothermal, hydrothermalite brines moving into those systems, and these typify the east and the north of the Salar de Atacama Valley. And then in the western margin, we have outcropping and subcropping Miocene diapyric salt. We can see that quite clearly here. In the Cordillera de la Salle, we have outcropping and subcropping diapyric salt. The main halite nucleus in the southern end of Salar de Atacama is fed water from river input pretty much along a north-south axis. So at the northern end of the Salar, we have an extensive sulfate system. And then along the eastern margin of the Salar, we have this set of coalescing bahadas or alluvial fans where we have a feed coming off the stratovolcanoes and moving waters into the drainage. Generally, the drainage in this closed basin system is toward the south. We have the most saline brines captured in that region outlined in brown, that is the halite nucleus fasces. And sitting atop that halite nucleus fasces, we have a series of brine fields and concentrator pans where the lithium brines are concentrated by solar evaporation. If we go to the northern end of Salar de Atacama Valley, we can see quite clearly the two main feeder sources for the lithium brines in that system. We have these stratovolcanoes. Here's Le Canabo on the northern end. And we are standing on Cordillera de la Salle, where we can see the diapyric salt residues and ridges on that western margin of the valley. 
So what does that mean in terms of this system, which is basically feeding less saline waters into an evaporative sump, and those waters are being concentrated? Well, if we look at lithium concentrations, we can see that lithium is a relatively conservative element. It stays in solution, as does sodium, until we reach halite saturation. So here we have a plot of lithium on the vertical axis, sodium on the horizontal axis, and you can see the change in the levels of both sodium and lithium as we concentrate those brines. Around the margins, we have regions of low temperature weathering. As we move further out into the vegetated regions, we have evapotranspiration taking place. As we move into the saline margin itself, we have zones of brine mixing between less saline and more saline waters of the salar system. And as we go into the capillary evaporation zone, the region where we have the halite nucleus, we can see the effect of halite precipitation. As the halite's precipitating, the level of sodium is decreasing while the level of residual lithium in the pore brines is increasing substantially. Ultimately, we reach a situation where those pore brines can range up to 1400 ppm. It seems that halite crystallization is playing a very fundamental role in that enrichment of lithium in the salar brines. And it's those enriched lithium brines which are then fed and pumped into those concentrated pans. If we look at the natural levels of lithium across the halite nucleus, the southern end of Salar to Atacama, we have the Cordillera de Sal in the upper left, the northwestern margin of that halite nucleus. You can see that the lithium levels there are quite high. Browns indicate levels as high as 4,900 milligrams per litre in that system. And so there's a concentration of brines up in against the Diapyric province. And there's also a concentration of brines in the lowest part of the sump as we move to the south around that peninsula which pokes out into the southern margin of Salar de Atacama. The green region here is actually mapping out the distribution of the halite nucleus. In this system overall what we have is a series of sourcing waters both hydrothermal and evaporitic which will pass through low temperature silicate weathering where we have lithium rich rhyolitic ash flows and tufts coming off those strata volcanoes. Around the margins and in the rival feed zones, we have evapotranspiration taking place. And then as we move out into the sump, we go through the salar margin where we have brine mixing occurring between fresher and the more saline waters of the halite nucleus. And ultimately, the water flows into the halite nucleus where that final concentration of the natural brine is taking place, giving us those very elevated levels of lithium. And as we discussed in the hydrology course, we want to have a system then for lithium enrichment where the surface of the salar looks like capillary evaporation is taking place, as we can see in that image on the left. We don't want a halite free surface to our salar because we're not getting that final wicking phase, that capillary wicking phase, which is facilitating the enrichment and the cycling of lithium in those pore brines. And of course, once those pore brines reach halite saturation, they're becoming more dense and they sink back down into the reservoir of lithium rich brines in the shallow subsurface of the salar. So, beneath the halite nucleus, we see the maximum lithium enrichment in this type of hydrology. And we can also see that this process of evaporation within the capillary zone is not just changing the levels of lithium. It's also facilitating a decrease in the magnesium to lithium ratio. In the margins, we have magnesium to lithium ratios of around 240 and more in the riverine inflows and the fresher groundwaters. But by the time we move out through that concentrated series into the halite nucleus zone, which is what we're seeing in the red, we can see that the magnesium to lithium ratio has fallen to values of 10 or less. And so with the increasing capillary concentration within the salar sump, we see these much lower magnesium to lithium ratios. And that's because magnesium is being taken up in various magnesium clays, the adipurgites and so on, and also taken up in the precipitation of syndepositional alkaline earth carbonates, the magnesium calcites, the dolomites, and so on. Now, the reason we want low magnesium to lithium ratios is that magnesium has a negative effect if it's at present at high levels in a brine. It creates lithium double soak complexes, which are difficult then to extract, so ideally we want brines in our concentrator pans which have relatively low magnesium to lithium ratios. And of course this is happening naturally as we see here in Salar de Atacama. Now once we're out on the halite nucleus, we have a series of brine fields with feeder wells which are moving brine into those concentrator pans. 
And within those concentrator pans, you can see here that there are some pans which have a olive green to brown coloration. These are the brines that have been cured typically over 12 to 18 months, depending on the climate, to a level where we have 6,000 ppm or more of lithium in that residual brine. They're also at bischofite saturation, as we'll see shortly. So those cured brines are taken from those olive green pans and they're pumped off into the processing plant where they are then processed and the processing method will depend on the chemistry and it varies from salar to salar, the end result being lithium carbonate. There's also an addition required as we go through the concentration series when we're in the lower end of the bitter and salt concentration pan. Remember that these brines that are coming in here are just about a halite saturation when they first come out of the subsurface in Salar de Atacama. And what we need to do as we move those brines through the lower end of the bittern phases is add lime, calcium hydroxide. That has the tendency to remove magnesium from the brine system. So we need a lime solution, we need fresh water and we need calcium hydroxide, lime to feed into the system to reduce the levels of magnesium even though they start off with levels of less than 10, to further reduce that magnesium in those successively concentrated ponds so that we end up with a calcium chloride brine, typically at carnalite bischofite saturation, which is then removed from those pans and processed to create lithium carbonate. This is what the final concentrated ponds look like on the ground. And you can see the stratovolcanoes, the ultimate source of the lithium, off in the background here. So let's look at how we get to this stage. How do we get to the stage from a brine feed out of the halite nucleus into the final concentration pans with values of 6 weight percent lithium? So what happens in the solar pans once we remove the brines from the halite nucleus subsurface and pump them into those succession of pans? Remember that we're in a high altitude, cool, hyper-arid climate and that we've already had the halite nucleus capillary evaporation taking place, this lithium enrichment. So we have brines coming out of the system into these pans which are just about at halite saturation and they already have lithium values in excess of 1200 ppm. So what we're doing is we're taking those lithium rich pore waters, letting them concentrate as a series of successively more saline pans till we ultimately end up with a brine which has between 4,000 and 6,000 ppm after sitting in successive pans over a period of 12 to 18 months. Now along the way, we pass through the various bitterm salt saturation stages and we can remove economically muriate of potash and also process to obtain sulfate of potash from those less saline bitterm pans in the system. Fertilizer is a byproduct concentration process in these pans. Once that brine is taken off the system into the processing plant, it's then treated with trona, sodium carbonate, soda ash, to precipitate the lithium carbonate. Once again, water is required for this process to mix and create the double salt precipitation of lithium carbonate. So coming back to the pans, let's have a look at what happens along that series of concentration pans as we move from the initial brine well infeed to the final 6000 ppm bischofite pan system. Here we've got successively lower numbers indicating in the various evaporation ponds successively higher salinities. So in the initial feed pans where we have poor brines coming in from the brine wells, we have the initial pans at halite and gypsum saturation. So calcium sulfate is being removed here. Once that calcium sulfate is removed, we go into the halite saturation and then we move into with successively more concentrated pans into sylvite, the potassium chloride salt, and then sylvite plus carnalite, carnalite being the magnesium potassium chloride hydrated salt, and into bischofite, which is the magnesium chloride hydrated salt. And it's once we get into those final ponds, ponds three, two, and one, that we get into the levels of lithium in excess of four to 6,000 ppm, which are suitable then for processing and the manufacture of a lithium carbonate, which is then further processed to give us the more valuable commodity of the lithium hydroxides. So this is the brine chemistry as we move through that concentrating succession. The inflows, well 1, ditch 4, well 20, are basically sodium, potassium, magnesium chloride brines with relatively low levels of boron and lithium. But once we hit the halite concentration pans, we can see that sodium chloride is then being removed and we can see that the levels of sodium are falling back, being removed as halite and relatively increasing the levels of potassium and also magnesium in the system. 
The levels of potassium are then reduced by the precipitation of sylvite, the potassium chloride bitter and salt in the pans. And so we can see that decreasing trend in the potassium values. Notice that magnesium is acting as a fairly conservative component here. So its levels are increasing significantly as the salinity increases. And this is why we add lime to the system to decrease the levels of magnesium in these concentrator pans at the carnalite stage. Carnalite being a magnesium chloride, potassium chloride salt, we start to see the levels of magnesium decreasing and we're also facilitating that by the addition of lime. And at the same time, we can see that the relative levels of lithium and also boron are increasing across that evaporation series as the salinity increases. By the time we get to the bischofite stage or the carnalite bischofite stage, we are looking at a system which is basically a magnesium chloride brine. We are precipitating a hydrated magnesium chloride salt. And we have the levels of lithium approaching concentrations suitable for extraction. We need water in this system, and that's a problem because we are interfering with water table. As we pump brines from these brine wells, we are creating problems with the groundwater, the natural groundwater system in this area. And of course, that's affecting the lives of the indigenous population that live around Salar to Atacama and many of the other high altitude Salars in the Andes. And this illustrates the effects of that. The left hand diagram is showing you the depth of the water table in 1986 when production began to where it was in 2018. And you can see that in what is the most enriched area for lithium, we have drawn down the water table to depths of more than two meters across that southwestern portion of the system. Now, if we look at the water table drawdown relative to the positioning of the various concentrator pans in the diagram on the right, you can see quite clearly that there is water table drawdown in that southwesterly position where we have drawdown in places of more than 10 meters, 5 to 10 meters. So this is a real problem within this region that has to be addressed and dealt with. And SQM has had an ongoing hydrological program to reduce freshwater usage in this system so that we then get a more equitable distribution of the groundwater. Of course, water drawdown also means that we are bringing in water from the margins to replace that drawn down water. And so we are lowering the regional water table in the areas around the salar. If we look at what's the ideal situation for this type of salt flat or salar concentration pan series, we need elevated lithium contents in the inflow brines. Ideally, this is in areas of rhyolitic lithium enriched volcanic, hydrothermal and diapyric dissolution. And you can have a look at the training modules that are available for free on the website to look at how this enrichment takes place and where in the world this enrichment takes place. It's certainly taking place in the Andes, where we have multiple magma chamber differentiation on the way up to the surface, giving us a brine system which is ultimately lithium enriched. We need a climate that's not too hot and an evaporation rate that's not too high. If we have a dry, hot, arid desert, we'll tend to desiccate the system well before we reach the level of ongoing long-term capillary evaporation and accumulation of halite. And in fact, the halite nucleus in Salad Atacama and many of the other salines in the region has been shown to be rising over time due to the ongoing input of these brines into the capillary zone. So we need capillary evaporation between an aggrading halite nucleus. But processing in this type of system requires extraction and in an arid, cool climate system that will affect the regional hydrology. And so those effects must be monitored and controlled in any region where we are using salar salt flat hydrologies to create a lithium rich brine. Okay, let's move on now and compare that now with the perennial lake waters and the lithium brines in China. Now China has two styles of lithium brine resources. The Tejanar style in the Kwaidan Basin, where lithium production is a byproduct of potash fertilizer manufacture, as we discussed in the potash course. And then we have Lake Zabuye, which is a perennial lake system. The lithium resource in China is around 1.5 million tons. That's about 7% of current world reserves. Of that 1.5 million, brines account for about 80% of the Chinese lithium manufacture reserves. And 50% of that is held in the Kwaidan Basin and 28% is held in the high altitude lakes, Lake Zibuye, for example, in Tibet. The remaining 20% of the reserves in China are the solid ore spodumene sources distributed across the Xinjiang, the Sichuan and the Henan provinces. So lithium in China is in two styles. 
It's relatively straightforward in terms of recovery in the carbonate dominant brine lakes of Tibet, where we have very low magnesium to lithium ratios naturally, and we can actually precipitate lithium carbonate directly from the brine. Recovering lithium is much more problematic in the magnesium sulfate systems in the Kwaidam lakes, where we start off with magnesium to lithium ratios, which can be as high as 150 or more. And so processing of those brines as part of the potash processing is quite expensive. It requires a lot more of chemical input and it requires a lot more water. There's very little public data on the actual costings in those Kwaidam, East Tajanar provinces in the Kwahan Desert. We're going to focus in on the Zabaye Tibetan high altitude lakes in the rest of this discussion. This shows you the Kwaidam Basin salt lakes in the Kwahan region where we have very high magnesium to lithium ratios in excess of 100 or more in many of the lakes versus Zabuye Kaka on the lower right, which is the lowest magnesium to lithium ratio of any system known in saline brines in the world. This is why we're seeing Zabuyeite precipitation in the concentrator pans in Zabuye. Lithium in the Zabuye Basin in China is a low magnesium brine system and it's precipitating natural lithium carbonate. That was why the mineral was named after that lake system, lithium carbonate. The mineral is called Zabuyeite. Lake Zabuye is the only known natural occurrence of a lithium carbonate accumulation. In the lake system prior to the setup of the concentrator pans, it was a finely dispersed salt fraction in the lake sediments. Now we've set up a series of concentrator pans in the lake so that we can produce pure lithium carbonate salt. So these lithium carbonate lakes occur in the high altitude positions in the Himalayas. We are in the alpine tundra. We're well above the tree line and we have lithium carbonate naturally precipitating from the lake. The lake in its natural form is perennial. Water levels fluctuate according to rainfall, snowfall and climate temperature each year. In 2008, the water level was at 4,422 metres, and at that level, the lake's area is about 247 kilometres in that northern perennial lake. You can see here it's made up of two parts. It's made up of a permanent perennial lake to the north, and then an overflow ephemeral lake to the south. So once water levels in the northern lake get too high, they spill over into that southern lake. The anthropogenic pans that are manufacturing lithium carbonate are located around the edges of that southern overflow lake. The salinity in this system is about 10 to 15 times that of seawater. So we're looking at salinities between 360 to 440 parts per thousand. And of course, the salinity will fluctuate depending on the inputs each year from the surrounds and also on the climate, the evaporation rate, the temperature. If you go to the links in the PDF version of this talk, which accompanies this talk, you'll see that there is much more detail on the geology of Zabuye Lake. There's also more detail on the geology of Salo de Atacama as well. And there's also a little bit on the physics of evaporation and heliothermy, much more than I'm going to deal with in this talk. So Zabuye Lake, Kakamini Lake, is of significant economic value. It's a new type of lithium brine deposit, and estimates of the reserves range up to 1.8 million tonnes. It's unique in that reserve is held in a natural precipitate of heliothermal lithium along with borate salts in these anthropogenic pans. In addition, this lake also contains significant volumes of potash, halite, natron, glauber salt, and natural hydrated sodium sulfate salt, mirabilite. There's also elevated levels of cesium, rubidium, and bromine in these lakes. Those images are showing you on the right how the zebulite precipitates on the pan floors in these heliothermal pans. Once they're pumped, that zebulite can be collected and shipped. I'm going to show you now an area that's on the margin that joins the northern and the southern lake and we're going to look at the pans on that margin. Notice that there are two regions of pans. There's pans on the southern side of that separating peninsula and there are also pans off to the western margin of the overflow lake. So looking across that peninsula we can see those pans. We've got the northern perennial lake on the right to the north and the southern overflow lake on the left and a series of concentrated pans in this plant which is producing lithium carbonate. There's also a set of heat sink plants to facilitate through heliothermy a heat exchange into those lake systems. I'm going to explain why we do that in a moment. These pans which are storing Zabuyu brines are heliothermal. Heliothermal, the concept means, and you can read up on this in the link on the physics of evaporation and heliothermy at the end of this talk, 
these pans are heliothermal in that they are density stratified. So if you're standing in one of these pans, your feet are standing in brine, which is much saltier, and it's also much warmer than the brine that's at your shoulder level, which is less saline and cooler. And we can see that in the salinity profiles on the left. This is taken on a one-year cycle. So there's March 28, April 21st, and May 2nd in this plot. And you can see how the lower waters are much more saline, which means they're more dense than the upper waters. You can also see by the position of the uppermost measurement above the pond bottom that there is evaporative drawdown in those pans over that three-month period. The image on the right is showing us the same heliothermal profile. In this case, it's temperature profiles going from March through June. And so we can see in March, the early spring onset, that we have surface waters that are below zero, that minus five or so, and bottom waters which are around seven, eight degrees centigrade. But by the time we get to June, we have a system where we have the bottom waters at temperatures in those lower heliothermal brines of up to 40 degrees centigrade. So there is a heating process taking place in those bottom waters. Now that's significant because if we look at the solubility of lithium carbonate in those brines, you can see quite clearly that as you go from temperatures of 10 degrees up to temperatures of 40 degrees, there's a significant decrease in the solubility of lithium carbonate. It's coming out of solution. It's a heliothermal salt. It's being produced by that heating in that bottom brine. Because lithium carbonate solubility decreases at higher temperatures, that heliothermal stratification drives the precipitation process of sheets of lithium carbonate zebulite on the floor of those perennial concentrated pans. If we also add sodium carbonate to the system, when we're looking at temperatures of less than 15 degrees, we can see that once again, the solubility of lithium carbonate on the horizontal axis on the diagram on the right we can see that that solubility is decreasing as we increase the level of sodium carbonate. Now, the Chinese engineers in Zibuye have taken advantage of this fact. They've built up heliothermal heat exchange systems so that we have a series of heliothermal brines maintained actually on that ridge in that photo that I showed you. And that allows them to feed hot water into the base of the bottom brines. So we have a heat exchange column set up so that we are heating the bottom of those pans to facilitate heating quicker and greater in those bottom waters to facilitate the precipitation of lithium carbonate. And there are also now plans afoot to track trona, which is quite common in the Kwaidan Basin, and carry it into this system to facilitate the precipitation of lithium carbonate by the addition of sodium carbonate. That's a distance of some thousand kilometers, so that's quite an undertaking to bring it from the Kwaidam into the Zabuye Lake. There's another problem here in terms of the volume of Zabuliite that we produce, and that is if we look at the natural concentration series taking place in Zabuye, the system goes halite saturation, apthitolite saturation, and then Zabuliite saturation, and onto sylvite, trona, and so on. But you can quite clearly see that we have this mixed potassium sodium sulfate salt apithitolite forming prior to zebuliite precipitation. Now the problem there is at the epithelite stage, we can draw out quite high levels of lithium from the brine into the salt mix, which is being precipitated as lithium sulfate, sodium sulfate double salts and other complex congruent lithium salts. And so we're actually removing a significant volume of lithium into the epithelite stage concentrator pans. And of course, that's problematic because we don't have as much lithium then going into the final concentrator pans where we're producing lithium carbonate. So what the Chinese engineers do is they try to hold the winter brines in those concentrator pans at mirabolite saturation. Mirabolite is a cryogenic salt. It forms as the residual brine concentrates as we form ice as a brine freezes. If we can remove significant volumes of sodium sulfate as mirabolite, then in the epithelite stage, we don't have as much take up of lithium in those complex double salts. So we keep the concentration series in the winter curing pans at the cryogenic mirabolite stage. Mirabolite's stable at temperatures of less than 10 degrees. So we want significant precipitation of cryogenic mirabolite. And then the amount of lithium lost to those double salts is less as we pass from the epithelite stage into the heliothermal zebuliite stage in the summer autumn precipitation series. We can see the, the natural path of that increasing salinity in those zebuliite brine pans by these white dots, giving us the passage over as we move from epithelite into sylvite 
And of course, the intermediate stage in there is the precipitation of lithium carbonate. We want it more in the sylvite field, the KCL field, than we want it in the pitholite field. Lake Zabula illustrates another problem here, and that is the problem of climate change. So here we've got, this is the southern overflow lake looking toward the surrounding mountains. This region is cold, but it's getting warmer on a decadal scale. Here is a plot of the mean annual temperature in Zabuye, and you can see quite clearly that there is an increase in the mean annual temperature from 1990 to 2020. And that's an increasing rate of about 0.1 of a degree centigrade per year. Now that has an effect in this sub-frigid arid climate zone, increasing levels of water moving into the northern lake and from there into the southern lake. So here's a plot of the water levels over that period. And you can quite clearly see that the northern lake, because of the increased level of water moving into the system, that northern lake shows a trend of increasing water level in that red plot. So water levels in the northern lake definitely rose between 1990 and 2014, as illustrated in this plot. And this is true regionally of other high altitude saline lakes in the region. And of course, we saw that that was a response to the increase in temperature, which is accelerating glacial melting. And it's also melting the permafrost, which is feeding more water into that system. If we look at the blue trend, which is the water level in the southern lake, there are periods when the northern lake levels are still higher than the southern lake, and so overflow waters are moving into those lakes seasonally. But as yet, we don't see a real obvious trend of a long-term rise in the southern lake. And that's because evaporation, which is in far in excess of precipitation in this region, still facilitates complete desiccation of that southern lake by the late summer, early autumn. So the salt flats are still maintaining a position where they're drying out each year, which allows the concentrator pans to be stable. But of course, if that trend increases and we get increasing water levels in the northern lake, this whole system is going to reach a situation hydrologically where the southern now overflow lake becomes a permanent perennial lake as well. And of course, once that happens, we will flood the concentrated pans in that southern lake. So it's going to be quite problematic if that heating trend increases in terms of production from Lake Zabuye. If we move those concentrated pans off the lake onto the adjacent sediments, we'll have problems with permeability because they are sitting on fluvial gravels and outwash gravels. They're a much more permeable subset to the fine-grained sediments that line much of that southern overflow lake in the present situation. Long-term climate change can make problems in many of these salar and perennial saline lake lithium systems. So there are some limitations. If we look around the world, there's fewer than 10 fully active lithium brine extraction facilities worldwide. They're economic, highly economic, much better prospects for lithium production in the current situation than solid ore systems. But successful production from one salar does not assure the same approach will work in another salar. Every salar in the Andes and in China is different. And so different salars are showing different chemical contents and permeabilities in the sediment field. We also know that the brine evaporation is strongly weather and climate dependent. That's why we see differences between 12 and 18 months curing times in the Andes. Every so often, Salad Atacama has a snow cover. So we need to design each brine field and processing facility specifically to be modelled in detail. Piloting needs to be carried out over many months and years before large-scale exploitation can begin in these lithium brine, salar and perennial lake systems. And of course, if we're studying, there's no production, and that lag time can be a strong deterrent to investment. And even though the operational costs of evaporitic technologies are relatively low in the salars and the perennial lakes, I mean, solar energy is doing all the work for you, the capital costs of building the facility are considerable. If we look at the last facility built in Argentina, which had a capacity of some 17,500 tonnes of lithium carbonate yearly, it cost a quarter of a billion dollars. The other problem with the brine approach, unlike the solid ore approach, is that we don't cope well with sudden surges or drops in demand. It's much more difficult to control your outputs on an annual basis in a brine operational system compared to a solid ore system where you can up and lower production levels in the mine. And so here are those links that I mentioned in terms of the various topics. 
if you need more detail. And you can also check out a couple of free course modules looking at the sources of lithium worldwide in our online Lithium from Brian course. Thanks for your attention, and I'll open it up for questions.